Welcome to another episode of The Zach Holly Show. Today, I have the honor of being with Dr. Alexander Valiga, or Alex. So, Dr. Valiga is the current chief resident physician in the Department of Dermatology and Cutaneous Biology here at Thomas Jefferson University. He grew up outside of Philadelphia in North Wales, Pennsylvania, and attended Drexel University, where he earned a bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering. After completing his undergraduate studies, Dr. Valiga then continued on to Drexel University College of Medicine. During this time, he was honored to be elected co-president of his medical school for four consecutive years and received the Joel Roslin Award, an honor reserved for a single member of the graduating class in recognition of outstanding leadership while demonstrating a notable level of commitment and service to his fellow classmates. After graduation, Dr. Valiga then completed an internship in internal medicine at Lankanel Medical Center and is now halfway through his final year of dermatology residency at Thomas Jefferson, where he is also serving as the chief resident. With his academic interest in cutaneous oncology, Dr. Valiga will continue his training with a fellowship in micrographic surgery and dermatologic oncology at Penn State. Congratulations, you just found out last week, right? Exactly, thank you so much. Amazing, (laughs) amazing, congratulations. Uh, After which he hopes to continue his career in academic medicine. Welcome, Alex. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much for having me. I'm super excited to get started. I'm excited too. So the way these work, I'm going to start off with some statistics around dermatology, happiness, burnout. Uh, Would you choose this specialty again? And then we'll see if you have any thoughts on these statistics. Sounds good. So the median attending physician salary across the U.S. is $339,000, while in Dermatology, it's 370,000. Average hours is 51 hours per week, while in dermatology, it's 45 hours per week. You guys were the winner on that one for hours per week in, in regards to lowest amount. Uh, 59% of all U.S. attendings were happy compared to 78% of Durham attendings. You are the winner, again, in that statistic. 47% burnout on average across the U.S. with burnout at 33% in dermatology. You were second place in that one. when asked, would you choose the same career, the same specialty again? And America said, you know what? We choose the same specialty. In dermatology, 68% said they would choose the same specialty again. The winner. (laughs) Step two score average across the U.S. was 246 in regards to all general physicians, uh, with dermatology being at 255. So any thoughts on these statistics whatsoever, just to start off with? Yeah, absolutely. I think... First of all, I, I definitely learned some things there. There are yeah. a few in there that I didn't even know. Yeah. Uh, so that, that was good. That was enlightening for me. Um, I think one thing that that's, sticks out, and, and I had I didn't know the exact number, but I knew that, that Durham was one of those specialties where people were happy. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, both satisfied and then choosing their specialty again. So I think, you know, a lot of those reasons for that, I'm sure, boil down to a lot of the reasons people go into the specialty. Um, you know, it's something where you're able to, kind of build longitudinal relationships with patients, which, you know, for me personally is something that I find really gratifying. Um, and then I think also, you know, it's like the variety of especially too. And, you know, I'm sure we'll get into that, but yeah. um, I think there's a lot of factors, but I think those factors, I wouldn't be surprised if they were the same as a med student that they are once you're like a mid-career attending. So. Yeah. Yeah. Were those factors part of the decision that made you choose dermatology in the end? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's tricky when you're a med student looking into Durham because you don't have a ton of exposure. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's kind of an unfortunate reality, I think, for a lot of med students um, looking into the specialty. So I think you get these, like, glimpses of saying, like, oh, like, this attending, like, every once in a while, like, I can even remember, like, rotating. You have yeah. that one attending that just, like, lights up when they see a certain patient, and they've known them for years, mm-hmm. and they're on first-name basis. There's, like, hugs. You know, there's, like, 10 minutes of the visit is asking yeah. about the kids, how the holidays were. Um, and other specialties have that too, um, but I think it, it it's part of Durham, and I, I think it really makes it satisfying. I think uh, the relationship and getting to help, you know, everyone from that someone who's become a longtime friend to the new person who's having this like acute issue that you can fix, uh, or at least help and give them some relief and work together. I think that's really gratifying. No, so. that sounds that sounds cool. So tell us though, what is dermatology? Yeah, so Derm, um, admittedly, I was thinking about this. I was yeah. like, I almost looked at my textbook. I was like, I better nail this. Or like my attending or like future fellowship director. They'll come at you. Yeah, exactly. Um, but generally speaking, I think it's, it's the study of the skin, the hair, the nails, and the mucous membranes. Got it's kind it. of okay. how, um, and I think the hair and the nails one, and even mucous membranes, I think sometimes is surprising for people. Like yeah. All patients skin, say. Skin, yeah. nails, hair, mucous membranes. Mucous membranes is an interesting one. It is. Because, uh, I mean, well, I think especially it's like oral mucosa, yeah. I would say mostly. But, I mean, like genital mucosa as well. Yeah. Um, I think that's that's one side of dermatology that um, people don't realize. But 
you know, all patients, you know, maybe like sheepishly ask me, yeah. you know, to examine a certain area. And that's like yeah. part of our specialty. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think that's part of what makes it interesting because as you might expect, there's just like yeah. a ton of things that can go disease wrong. I'm going to reveal my lack of dermatological knowledge here. <laughs> but I mean, I one thing I remember in rounding the hospitals, like Steven Johnson syndrome or something like that, is that that's a, so would you consult derm for something like that? Yes, you, you should would. consult you derm. You should consult derm should, for something please, like that. Okay. consult derm. Um, but it's tricky, and I think a lot of specialties where they're— and Derm, I think, is in that category of, like, yeah. it's so specialized, and you spend— I can remember my Derm unit in my med school, uh -huh. and not to speak poorly of it, but it was, like, it was like you know, two or three days. And it, and that's just by virtue yeah. to cover so much, so I yeah. totally understand. But, um, you know, a lot of non-dermatologists, like, there's a lot of things that, you know, maybe they're not familiar with that yeah. we spend so much time studying, so— uh, any concern for SJS, you definitely yeah. want to get No, it's because I'm trying board. to think back to my med school, and I think I remember the layers of the skin, and it was almost like a combined histology class with it because we had to learn, you know, the squamous layer, and sometimes, oh, it's different on the palms and the soles of your yeah. feet. You have different layer of skin. Like, why, do. why, is, why is this? Why do I get to those? <laughs> I don't know. So it, it is interesting. So you, you didn't have much experience in dermatology in before medical school, right? I did not. So clinical yeah. derm, I didn't. Um, I did have some research experience. Yeah. Um, that was like where my passion kind of developed for Durham yeah. and, and put it kind of in the back of my mind going mm. into med school. I, I knew Durham was something that I was interested in. Yeah. Um, but uh, clinical Durham, I did not. Got it. Yeah, so. so when did you make the decision of Durham is for me? Was it pre like before you went into med school, you're like, oh, it's kind of cool, but I'm going to leave my options open? Or was it 100% Durham all the way, skin for life kind of thing? And mucous so, memories and nails and hair. And there you go, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I would say, I don't know, maybe like, I think I went kind of like, you know, I'm definitely going to go for this. Maybe like midway through second year, yeah. I had had time to, to shadow and, and get a little clinical experience and um, understand that this is something I could see myself doing. I think that's that's important to do. But it's always in the back of my head. I, I, because of my research in melanoma, I had thought about doing oncology and doing the internal medicine route. Um, but I think I committed around my, my second year. So Was it an epiphany moment or was it like a slow burn? Uh, it's definitely slow burn. Slow burn. I'm not, I mean, I'm sure there are people that have those epiphany moments. Yeah. And I think that's great because I think that's, you know, you have like this kind of mile marker of clarity to look back on. But I think in reality, a lot of these things are like much more muddy. Yeah. And it honestly requires like a little bit of faith. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, Durham, because you don't get as much experience, there's that little voice in the back of your head, I think that says like, oh, you know, maybe there's something about this special I wouldn't like, you know, and I'm diving all all in on it. But, um, you know, I, I think it's it's one of those things where for, for the most part, I feel like most people are surprised at how much they like it mm -hmm. um, or they'll be able to find something that they love. Yeah. So, yeah. Were you between other specialties? Was it like, oh, because I know you're doing a surgical fellowship, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where you like, surgery seems pretty cool. What if I did that? I, I never, the OR wasn't for me. I see, okay. That was something, and, and like obviously like third years yeah. is when uh, at my med school when we had our surgical rotations, but I was never really, like I, I it just never really appealed to me. Yeah. I, I didn't um, really see myself in an OR. Uh, I certainly kept an open mind. I think that's crucial too. Yeah. Um, and sort of speaks to, you know, you can have something in the back of your head, but I think it's so important to kind of keep yourself open yeah. until you get an exposure to things. So you never know, I mean, what's going to pique your interest. And I think that's good general advice for medical school in general. But I think the only other thing I considered was internal medicine. Internal um, medicine. I love the problem solving aspect mm -hmm. of things. Um, and that's something that attracts me about, you know, in dermatology. Yeah. I was just talking with my attending about like a great case we saw at the end of yeah. clinic yesterday uh, and, and turning it over in our heads. And I, I love that analytical process and you get that in IM. Yeah. Um, I think there's just a variety that we can talk about later that um, attracted me to Durham yeah. and like seal yeah. the deal. So. so in second year, you kind of were like, this is, I'm pretty sure this is what I want to do. And then when you had your clinical rotations in third year, it was kind of like, this is definitely what I want to do. But it's interesting because there's no dermatology rotation in third yeah. year. Yeah. Right? So it was just kind of eliminating the others. Yeah. I mean, eliminating sounds like so cold and clinical, <laughs> but uh, essentially, yeah, I, I think you, you get an impression and this is like something that I feel like I, I've said maybe once or twice to people that are interested in Durham. And I think you need to kind of be comfortable with like the boring parts of your specialty. Like what is the high frequency, like possibly boring thing that you're going to see on a, a daily basis. And while it might be like a little monotonous, a little bit boring, is it something that like you can deal with? Or is this something where you're like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to be able to handle this. Mm -hmm. If this is like, if I have a whole day of this or a few days of it or something like that. Um, and I found that in certain specialties, you know, I, 
I wanted like a little bit more action than like the rounding of internal medicine. I knew that I wasn't good for the OR, um, you know, and I think gradually I kind of just felt more comfortable with dermatology and sprinkling in those shadowing experiences throughout third year and second year helps. That sounds like a really good, getting those shadowing experiences in. How did you know uh, you weren't good for the OR? Was it kind of, you didn't like the vibe, you didn't like the attending, was it a bad experience? Because I think it's a decision where, the first thing they tell us, right, in medical school is they're like, you know, you should decide if you want to be like in the OR or outside of the OR, basically. That's the first decision they make. Do you want to be cutting things or not? Uh, And for me, I had a great time in both of them. I really liked the OR. I loved the experience, but I didn't like everything outside of the OR. And that's kind of how I decided against it. How did you decide? I think it's all about, I think a really helpful barometer for picking, especially one that I use for the OR um, thing that you mentioned, is just seeing if if the people and the personalities are something that kind of, there's some, something you could get along with. Yeah. Because um, everyone has different groups, and I think broadly speaking, you know, there are different personalities and different specialties. Yeah. Um, and I felt like I would probably get along, you know, a little bit more smoothly with, you know, kind of the dermatologists that I worked with. I think it's generally especially where people are very easygoing. Uh, I think because it's outpatient, it lends itself to people yeah. that are conversational and and really want to take that time with patients. And and not that surgeons aren't like that by any yeah. stretch, but um, I think they're just little personality quirks that it's one of those things that you kind of like feel mm-hmm. um, when you're in the moment and it's tough to like pin a word down on it. But um, that was kind of what I used. Yeah. I think it's helpful. Yeah. Was, were you scared about, because we, we're told a lot, dermatology is one of the most competitive specialties there are in the world. We're also told this in regards to, you know, orthopedic surgery, neurosurgery. What are the other classic ones? Mm. The, those are the ones that, radiology, like that. Some, 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 or some, those are the ones that come to my mind. Did that kind of scare you off a little bit or not really? You're like, I got the research, but now I need to make sure I do the research. Got to score well on step one and step two. It's just kind of always there, right? I, I definitely had the fear. Yeah. I think yeah. I, I think I, I was not the person while I like I knew that it's it's something that I was interested in yeah. doing, I definitely like, you know, the fear, the anxiety, yeah. I think uh it's absolutely something that I yeah. that I went through. Um so dermatology applicants out yeah. there, like that is normal. Yeah. Like you're gonna feel that way. I felt that way with fellowship, yeah. I think. Um, you know, everyone in medical school is just, you know, very high achieving, you know, we're, we're to some extent used to kind of being the people that are, you know, able to be near the top mm-hmm. of the class and things like that. So naturally, I think that competition kind of, if not with just yourself, yeah. uh, I think drives that, that fear. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I think if you're able to realize that it's something that you can see yourself spending the rest of your life doing yeah. and that there's not another specialty where you'd be happier. Yeah. Absolutely. You should do it. Yeah. Um, okay. So good. Yeah. That's yeah. a great answer. Yeah. So into the training. So you match. Okay. Congratulations yes. on the match. Thank, so not only you. you match fellowship now, but you, you did match dermatology in I the did. past. Yes. What is the training like? So you do a year of and your prelim year in internal medicine, right? That was just a normal kind of internal medicine year. Uh, then what is, can you talk me through the each year of dermatology? Like in a chief year, you're more in a leadership role right now. You're kind of doing some maybe more organizations, running a team as opposed to kind of being kind of the runner goer, a part of the team. Can you just talk me through each year? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So um, first year you come in uh, as a, a first year dermatology resident. And I like to make the analogy just because it's something that I felt. It's almost like you're doing intern year again. Uh-huh. Uh, cause the, the language, the verbiage, the procedures, like it's all new. Mm. Um, and like, you're going to tell yourself you might do some reading during intern year. And I tried, <laughs> I did, a, I did some, but you're like, oh man, like we, I think there's a, a joke uh, that I've heard once or twice with like the rotators in Durham who uh-huh. are like fantastic, like fourth year Durham rotators are fantastic. Like they're so dialed in, they mm-hmm. do so much reading, they're motivated. And like, we like to kind of joke that they're, you basically know more then than you do as like a first year derm <laughs> after you've been doing internal medicine for years. So that's is a good of, point. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, you come in uh, with not a huge knowledge base and that analogy of like drinking from a fire hose, I think is a, a applicable mm-hmm. uh, because derm is so spe- like specialized. Yeah. Um, a lot of the language uh, and diseases are things that you don't encounter until derm residency. So the reading is a lot at first. Uh, and I think it's something that can be a bit of a challenge for some people. I mean, I know it was for me. Um, so there's a lot of reading, a lot of kind of getting yourself up to speed first year at, you know, it's different in every program, but you're starting to work in resident clinics where you're sort of supporting, uh, and attending, or I, I, attending clinics, and you're just mm-hmm. supporting attendings in those. And there's a little bit less pressure to kind of keep up with things. You can take your time. 
uh, with each patient. And a big thing in dermatology is kind of your, the pace of clinic. So it's classically very rapid, you know, making sure that you're staying on time and things like that while still sort of making sure that each patient is getting their issues addressed. Uh, as you move through uh, first year at Jefferson, by midway through the year, you start having your own resident clinic. So a resident clinic is something that is talked a lot about in dermatology. Some programs, every clinic is a resident clinic. At Jefferson, we start halfway through the year. Once you have a little bit of kind of a foundation of working in an attending clinic, in your resident clinic, those people are your patients. So your name is on the after visit summary. They're scheduled in, you know, under your name. It's like such a cool experience too. Cool. Yeah. your patients, right? It, yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Um, so you feel, I think, much more empowered uh, to kind of make clinical decisions and really kind of test out, you know, your knowledge base and, and you know, make sure that uh, you're able to kind of keep on pace uh, with a busy clinic. You know, you start at like six patients for an afternoon of like one to, you know, 4 p.m. Then all of a sudden it's eight patients. And before you know, you're up to like 13 patients. So it becomes pretty rapid. And that's, I'd say that's like first year in a nutshell. Second year is a little bit more of the same. Um, I should say, I forgot to mention first year, you start taking call halfway through the year. So it's nice at Jefferson versus I think some other programs that I'm familiar with, you have a little bit of a lag time to taking call, meaning that call, meaning that you're uh, sort of uh, at home. We, we do home call basically for dermatology. That's nice. Yeah, it is nice. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's a nice perk. I, I'll admit that. Uh, but you do get calls overnight. Yeah. So you basically get urgent surgical calls from patients who might have been in clinic and have a bleeding issue. You'll get hospital consults. Mm -hmm. They'll call you on that phone. I'm actually on call this week. Oh, geez. Uh, Are you on call right now? I'm not on call right okay. now in like T minus <laughs> like two and a half hours I'll okay, be on good, call. Good, good, so good. it's fine, yeah. But, um, and that's, you know, like a night call, home yeah. call kind of thing. Uh, so you start that uh, halfway through first year. The first years are, are kind of texting me now being like, you know, when are we going to go over call? Like I really, you know, I'm, I'm nervous and mm -hmm. they're all going to do fantastic because we have like excellent first years at, at Jeff this year. They're great. A little plug for them. Great. Um, but, uh, so you start call second year, of Durham residency, more of the same. You sort of build up your resident clinic, you're seeing more patients, you're called upon, I think, a little bit more in, in a kind of senior resident capacity to help with different diagnostic challenges, whether it's in our didactic conference uh, or out in clinic, you know, a difficult case, uh, you start having like first years come up to you and say, hey, I'm like kind of really struggling with mm -hmm. this, what would you do? You know, getting more comfortable with managing systemic medicines. I think that's one part of Durham that people, you know, uh, may not realize is that we we do kind of treat patients with some like high powered kind of what could be high risk medicines, you know, things like methotrexate, hydroxychloroquine, mm -hmm. isotretinoin, um, you know, as well as like uh, IV medicines as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think you, you start to build your confidence with that. You start uh, taking consults your second year, uh, which is basically like call, but you're sort of during the day essentially. Mm -hmm. So you're solely taking uh, hospital consults during the day. Um, which is, you know, always an interesting thing. I think that's when you get the most interesting cases, see those SJSs we were just mm -hmm. talking about. Monkeypox recently. You, so, yeah, so I rem <laughs> Oh, man. All right, well, you just got me on. Now we're going on a tangent. So Go for it. We years, love tangents. Third year's going to wait. Yeah. Uh, it's funny you mentioned that. So we have a annual um, Philadelphia Dermatological Society. Yeah. is one of, like, the oldest uh, academic dermatological societies in the country, and we run a, a conference every year. So yeah. each major academic center runs the conference. Jefferson is the first of the year. And we really wanted to present a monkeypox case because it's very topical, mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's tricky to find both, you know, it's a matter of a, that patient coming in. So we didn't really have a case. The conference was, was kind of coming up and out of nowhere, I had a patient come in for a skin check and had, you know, a rash and lo and behold, mm -hmm. monkeypox. So, um, and they were very, very gracious. And, you know, we were able to do a biopsy and, and, really just like a, I think a fantastic learning experience yeah. and super grateful for the, the patient's understanding to, you know, to let us kind of take samples yeah. and, and really get the whole clinical picture um, for the kind of the greater good yeah. of the, you know, the learning uh, community at, in Philadelphia. So is that the monkeypox isn't that, um, it's not deadly, right? It's not like, no, a, no. It's so a, it's not deadly, but it can be like, it can be disfiguring. And, and that's an issue with, with is some that the, of, I'm just wondering why the such stringent, um, like isolation conditions with monkeypox. Is it because it's very contagious? By, by and large, and and I think we're learning, especially in the day and age yeah. of COVID or you know, post-COVID, yeah. that we want to be very cautious about our understanding of how these Got conditions it. are transmitted. Got so it. I think there is an abundance of caution. Yeah. By and large, monkeypox is transferred by contact, essentially. Got it. Okay. Uh, there's some thought that it could be, you know, kind of uh, airborne, but I think that that suspicion is much lower. Got I think it. for the okay. most part, it's something that's transmitted contact. by contact. contact. I think 
I think part of it was a little bit of kind of sensationali- yeah. uh, uh, sensationalization, I guess that's yeah. the word, by the media yeah. um, or sensationalizing. Yeah. But I mean, how many, you said you saw one personally mm-hmm. and like maybe your colleagues have seen like a couple others, right? And you guys don't see a few amount of patients. You guys see Philadelphia is a, is a high yeah. number of patients coming through, yeah. right? Yeah. I think, yeah, I think a lot of the patients perhaps went to urgent cares. And yep. We certainly saw a few. Yeah. I think on the numbers, for example, like I worked, my intern year was during COVID mm-hmm. and I can remember the sheer volume of COVID mm-hmm. patients coming in. I mean, certainly this is nowhere near that. Yeah. Um, thankfully. But I mean, it is a condition that I think it presents very characteristically sometimes. Yeah. And it's a very striking clinical yeah. presentation. So, you know, patients are very understandably, you know, distressed, upset. Um, and in some cases it can be scarring. Um, yeah. It's not obviously as severe as something like a smallpox, but, yeah. um, you know, there is a recovery time associated mm-hmm. uh, with with the lesions. So and you want to take, you know, the whatever the proper health path, of medicine course, path, you take it. Exactly. You so we're it. off a tangent. Let's okay. get back. All right. So, <laughs> so, so first year, we're, prelim year, we're ignoring. Mm-hmm. Uh, then you have your intern year, which is kind of scary. You get kind of, you're with the attendees in the clinic in the beginning, but then at Jefferson, you get your own patients. Uh, and now third year, you're kind of taking more, just like you were in second year. Uh, so second year, you're taking more of a leadership role. Um, third year, is it more of that leadership role? Are you maybe doing more consults? How does it look? So third year, you do spend a good amount of time in clinic. I think one thing that's a bit more emphasized in third year, and to some extent second year, is that you start spending uh, a little bit more time in the procedural side of dermatology. So um, most surgery, you start spending uh, at least a month your second year, depending on if you have kind of a specialized interest. Like I remember getting a few extra weeks as I was interested Mm -hmm. in it. Third year, you get that month again. Yeah. Um, second and third year as well, you start doing, it's called our procedural rotation, but you have exposure to kind of more cosmetic procedures yeah. in addition to usually like a sprinkling of Mohs as well. Mm-hmm. Um, Mohs, just for the people who don't know. Oh, sorry. Is, yeah. No, you're good. Sure. So so Mohs is uh, essentially like Mohs micrographic surgery yeah. is basically a specialized surgical procedure Got it. where essentially it's microscopically controlled um, surgery where you're excising a tumor under local anesthesia looking at it under a microscope in real time and confirming the margin is clear and then essentially stitching the patient back up all yeah. on the same day. And it's cool, right? I mean, it's how long, Mose hasn't been around for that long, right? I believe since like the 60s. So yeah. it's originally named after Frederick Mose, yeah. uh, who pioneered the the technique of um, specifically kind of the histologic technique. And the data behind Mose is amazing, right? You should, there's yeah. much better outcomes you're doing. You're not, I mean, it makes sense in my head. You're If you see, you get, you've gotten to the end. I don't know, this is a whole thing. I, I, this, no, is, this is a tangent that I don't know if we need to go down, oh, but I'm, a certain I'm amount of margins and yeah. stuff like that. And once you get to this certain amount of margins, you can clinically say, okay, we can stop this, that kind of thing. Is that yeah, why it's so good? Okay. Absolutely. No. So more than happy to go on this tangent yes, too. Yes. So I think with Mose, if you think of like classically when something is, you know, in surgical oncology, yeah. for example, if they cut out something, it's often what we call bread loafed. So the sec- the surgical kind of section is basically cut like you would a, a yeah. loaf of bread. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you're looking at sections of the tumor that way. Um when that's done, and for example, when we get back a skin cancer that we just sort of biopsied and then it was bread mm-hmm. loaf, not in Mohs, mm-hmm. uh, we're only really looking at kind of almost like 1% of the margin in reality because mm. you're just looking at like a snapshot. So the traditional teaching is, okay, you've confirmed the skin cancer is there. Now we do an excision where they come back and you uh, cut out the tumor with a margin of healthy skin mm-hmm. or healthy appearing skin mm-hmm. where we know the data is going to confirm that you know, in 95% of patients, mm-hmm. you know, you'll get the skin cancer out wow. if you do it that way. Wow. Uh, with Mohs, basically the sectioning, instead of cutting it like a loaf of bread, is it's basically, it's called like unfoss, meaning you're able to, it's kind of like my, my mentor kind of describes it, like if you had a bunch of cereal bowls or like mm-hmm. there's a little like muffin papers or yeah. whatever. Uh-huh. You basically kind of slice the the sections that way, uh, so you're able to kind of like look, scooping, like an ice cream scooping kind of thing. Kind of, well, okay, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, okay. work. yeah. Um, and you're able to, that way because it's sectioned that way. You're yeah. able to assess the whole margin, so 100 uh, percent of the margin. So um, there is like exciting data that is very applicable for and effective for you know certainly for non melanoma skin cancers. You know, cure rates of up to 99 percent depending on the wow. tumor that you're looking at. Uh, it's very efficacious for um, thin melanomas and melanoma in situs. Wow. Uh, and kind of the biggest advantage with most surgeries is that a lot of patients for maybe a larger excision or, or for a melanoma or melanoma in situ, they don't, they don't need an OR um, or patients who would be poor candidates for general anesthesia. I think that's where it's exciting and, and, and useful to use. The reality is we're not doing those large excisions all the mm-hmm. time, but I do think 
Uh, it is from a healthcare usage standpoint, you know, a very economic, uh, economical way of, of using uh, or a kind of curing. I didn't those even skin know cancers, there's so. there's there's skin cancer so large that people need general anesthesia to kind of take. I had no idea, like because you can't local, like if it's a big something, you can't local anesthetic enough that it's not going to be painful enough to the person, or to, it's deep enough, or to, to some extent. I mean. With large enough tumors, you start worrying about like how much lidocaine you're going to need or how much local oh. anesthesia because you start reaching those limits of, mm-hmm. of you know, what are kind of toxic doses. Again, that's quite uncommon. Yeah. Um, but you certainly do have patients who have tumors large enough that could go to uh, general surgery and have them excise under general wow. anesthesia. But that is an advantage of Mohs. So. How big does a, does, a, does a tumor need to be to go to general anesthesia? I'm just that's curious. A, yeah, good question. Very subjective. Yeah, I don't know. You put me on the spot. Is it? Is it like? Yeah. Uh, is it like? I'm sure there's much. Big is a very general yeah, thing. Is it? Sure. I'm guessing depth and all these other fancy. I'm. I'm yeah. going back to my A B C D E. Sure. Of uh, looking at moles. Yeah. Right now, so but. I, I, you bring up a great word there, depth. So I yeah. think for like melanomas, for example, if someone has what we would kind of colloquially call like a depth melanoma, yeah, meaning something that has you know invasion beyond a certain point. Mohs is, is useful for what we call thin melanoma. So it's kind of just invaded past that, that basement membrane. Yeah. For thicker melanomas, especially if the patient also needs lymph node sampling, uh, it makes sense I to see. have them do everything under, uh, under general. It, it. Lymph node sampling makes sense. Exactly. So I you see. try to make it as sort of efficient as you can for the patient and, and limit the amount of surgical exposure they get. And that's where like surgical oncology is absolutely the gold standard. Awesome. But, I think Mohs is something that just complements the, yeah. the care that we can provide to patients yeah. with regards to, to curing and uh, skin cancers. So. Perfect. Yeah. So third year, you're doing more of these surgeries. Yeah. Is there mm-hmm. anything else you're doing more? You said more clinic time or less clinic time? It's, it's about the same. Okay. You, you start having, you kind of keep up the pace of yeah. resident clinic at that point. You know, midway through second year, you're starting to see your max amount in a, in a half day uh, or a session, as we call yeah. it. Some days you have two sessions or a full day of resident yeah. clinic. Usually that totals out to... Uh, you know, I've had 26 in a day, wow. which is like almost up to like an attending clip yeah. of patients yeah. that you're going to see. So it's it's most, I think the, the biggest thing, and this is for me personally, I think it's about building your kind of rhythm in clinic. So making sure that everyone is kind of adequately getting their concern addressed and, and they feel like they're leaving clinic with a plan, uh, but also kind of taking advantage of if someone has, you know, a spot of concern, you know, you're able to be efficient, you address mm-hmm. it, make sure you kind of talk about it and that patient leaves kind of satisfied that they feel that either their condition is treated or that they're reassured. Mm -hmm. But being efficient in that so that when a patient comes in with, you know, a diffuse rash and there's a lot of history behind it, you know, you're kind of talking through a lot of questions in the back of your head trying to work through your differential diagnosis. You have time for that. Yeah. And that's all, I think, about building the rhythm of clinic and and really takes, I think, like a full three years. For me, that was something that I I struggled with at first. But now, you know, I feel very comfortable in clinic. So, yeah. Yeah. And now... And now, so and I think an important point too yeah. is chief year in dermatology is part of your third year. Uh, so I'm I'm okay. both a, um, a PGY four and a, a chief. So I'm finishing. I see. Um, so is it a, is it like six months? Is it three months? Is it a whole year? A whole year. A whole okay, year. got it. Wow. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. And um, do you does that everyone does everyone do a chief year? No. So that's a great point. Yeah. So uh, at our program, and it's different based on yeah. which program you go to, but. There's only one chief um, at got Jefferson's it, program. It. I think as you kind of increase the number of residents, yeah. and Jeff's kind of like a, I think a middle of the ground, yeah. if not, or middle of the road, if not larger yeah. Durham program. We have 14 residents. Um, but, you know, I would say, you know, one person is probably able to, to handle that. Got it, got it, yeah, I see. So. And it seems like you're suited that for your, from your leadership background and oh, stuff thanks. like that. So this makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Was it hard residency training? You're nearing the end of it now. Yeah. It was yeah. hard. Yeah, I think... I mean, look, I, I know I'm very, like, the general surgery residents are going to be, like, shaking their fists right now, like, watching this. But I, I think any residency is hard. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember chatting with a, an attending, I think it was, like, a few weeks ago, and just saying, like, if you want to devote your all your time to dermatology, whatever specialty it is, even though that, you know, we get out of work at 5, we yeah. get there at 8 a.m., you can you can still find a way to do that. I think residency is a time where if you want to really devote a lot of that time uh, you're going to be able to. Because yeah. uh, it's so important in Derm 2 that I don't think a lot of people realize is that a lot of the reading and the learning that needs to take place is happens after hours. Yeah. So you, my uh, my program director, when he welcomes the new first-year residents, talks a lot about kind of the average amount of time that you might want to spend per week. What's kind the of, average amount of time per week? I think he puts like a 50-hour work week. Okay. Or s- 50 or 60. He's going to watch this and be like, total. that's not what that's I said. That's total? 
To, for a week. Got yeah. it. So if you're spending, yeah. uh, if you're going eight to five, what is that? So so like an extra five hours a week? Yeah, like nine to five of, is 40. Yeah. yeah so. Um, so I think the expectation is like maybe like two hours after work. Got it. Um, that's a that's an expectation. Yeah, and and it's all it's all self motivated yeah. too. Uh, not to say that other specialties don't you know you don't need to read after work. Yeah. Of course you do. But I think in dermatology it's so specialized and it kind of speaks back to how you feel like an intern when you start yeah. again. There's just a lot to learn. Uh, so you, that is a significant portion of the learning time. So I I do I, I think it's hard. Yeah, yeah. yeah so. so I know it's tough because the weeks differ. But an average week. In dermatology, are you in residency? Dermatology residency, are you spending three days in the clinic and one day in the hospital doing um, consults and one day academically doing other things? Or what, how is an average week? Would you yeah, say? That's a great question. So, our schedule is kind of broken up into blocks. So yeah. we have you have like a clinic block. During that clinic block, and I'd say you know first year you have I think six to eight months worth of clinic. Mm -hmm. Second year you have I think closer to five to account for those extra procedural yeah. rotations. During a clinic block, you're assigned to an attending or you have resident clinic. Got it. So you're just in clinic, whether, you know, and Jeff's, you know, I think one of the big advantages of training at Jeff mm -hmm. uh, is that we have clinics in Center City. We have clinics out in the Navy Yard, which is kind of, I think, a, a different population out there, certainly. We had clinics down in Delaware, where I think you see a different population mm -hmm. as well. We see uh, VA patients at the Wilmington, um, Delaware VA. So uh, a lot of kind of different populations that you're able to see in demographics of patients. So you kind of all get that during your clinic yeah. month, which is a big advantage. Uh, and weekends are weekends are off. That's nice. Yeah, it is nice. I, I so caveat <laughs> when you're on call, you do yeah. a Saturday clinics. So I do Got have it. Saturday okay. half day of clinic tomorrow. Got it. And how often May. are you on call? It it varies by year. Got it. So uh, as a first year on call, uh, basically about six weeks a year. Not I know. I, again, the surgery, right? they probably it's turned off bad. the video at this point. <laughs> Even I'm thinking, I'm, so I'm applying to internal medicine residency yeah. right now, and we get one on, in general, the programs I look at, you get one golden weekend, then you get yeah. one black weekend, yeah. and then you get one week. So so two weeks are one day weekends, mm -hmm. one week is zero day weekend, and one week is a two day weekend every yeah. month. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So every week is a golden yeah. weekend in dermatology. Yeah. That is a big advantage. Yeah. I won't sugarcoat it. Yeah. Now, fellowships. Can All you do? Right. I want you to answer two questions for All me. Right. Wait, three questions for All me. Right. No tangents. The first, right. No tan. Well, you can do tangents. <laughs> okay. I like our tangents that yeah, we did. Right. They were interesting. The sure. first. So the first question is, what possible? And of course, I think there may be a lot. But what are the main possible fellowships you can do after a general uh, dermatology residency? Which fellowship are you going into? And what is that? Our four questions. Jesus. So which <laughs> fellowship are you going into? What is it, and why? Okay. So that's your fellowship. Okay. And then the first question, though, is. All right. What are the possible fellowships after okay. dermatology? All right. So the possible fellowships, you have pediatric dermatology. Yeah. You have uh, micrographic surgery and dermatologic oncology, which Got is it. what I'm uh, doing next year. You have um, cosmetic dermatology, uh, and then you have dermatopathology. Got um, it. And these are a year usually? Usually a year. There, yeah. There's a few um, kind of two-year programs here and there, but by and large, uh, dermatology fellowships for about one year. Uh, and there are other, I should say, kind of other fellowships as well, yeah. something like hair transplant as a dermatology fellowship. Got but it. So I think, I guess, technically five. I'm yeah. sure there's more kind of, of yeah, those are the sub, main sub specialty ones. fellowships, yeah. but those yeah. are the main ones, I would and say. And why did you pick your one? This Mose, I can't even make sure I say it right. This, uh, <laughs> let's see if I can, micrographic surgery and dermatologic oncology. Yeah, what is that and why? Absolutely. So uh, Mose, we sort of uh, discussed yeah. kind of the technique Micrographic surgery is just a way of kind of microscop microscopically controlling kind of the tumor or evaluating the tumor while they're in the office. And then a part of it that isn't really part of that is also the reconstructive aspect. So mm -hmm. uh, to do a Mohs fellowship, you learn how to interpret um, frozen sections, basically, which is how we process the tissue. So you interpret them, uh, make sure the tumor's out. And then a big part of it is the reconstruction aspect. So uh, one of my mentors uh, said once that it's easier to kind of like make the hole rather than to put it back together kind of thing. <laughs> so reconstruction is absolutely crucial yeah. and really important. Uh, so it's a big emphasized part of a lot yeah. of Mohs fellowships, which um, is something that I'm very excited for. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the Mohs micrographic surgery. The dermatologic oncology um, side of things, of course, you know, relates to cutting out skin cancers. Yeah. But also relates to, and I think it's becoming more and more relevant is the role that kind of the most surgeon plays on managing maybe more high risk patients. Uh, high risk meaning, you know, tumors that have a propensity to spread or maybe they already spread. I think there's a lot of medicines uh, that are being used today, mostly in kind of the immunotherapy realm that one are very exciting uh, and are helping a lot of patients. But 
Unfortunately, they do have kind of side effects that are very much dermatologic mm -hmm. in kind of origin. And I think the dermatologic surgeon is one, you're board certified dermatologist. So you're kind of trained to recognize some of those things. But I think you're very uniquely positioned to be kind of an important member of that team. And it was exciting interview interviewing at a lot of places because that, you know, the Mohs surgeon was playing an important part mm. with on the team with, you know, Medonk and Radonk. And I think that's, you know, those are the, those are the patients that I think are, are certainly a challenge, but I think those are also kind of the most rewarding. So yeah. that's kind of micrographic that's surgery. That's one of my, just interrupt you quickly. That's Please, one yeah. of my favorite parts of medicine too. Yeah. I think it's it was something I really loved about surgery when we were doing, uh, I was, did a colorectal surgery rotation and we were really close in this female's pelvis and like there was the uterus here and we didn't know what to do. So then the, the gynonc surgeon came in oh, nice. and they okay. came and like helped out. And then the urology team came in because we were really nose about. And it sounds like that's what this is. You're kind yeah. of all coming together as a team. And that's kind of also the the, one of the benefits is being at one of these bigger institutions where you see a lot more diverse pathology and also patient population totally. is you're getting these these opportunities. Absolutely. So I hope that isn't the answer to why you did it, but well, well, why yeah. did you pick it? So I, for me, it goes back like before med school. So I had done research into um, at the West Star Institute yeah. in Philadelphia looking at um, the mechanisms that underlie therapy resistance in melanoma. So that was like incredibly interesting research. I really enjoyed it. I, I didn't even like want necessarily, like I wasn't looking for that kind of mm -hmm. research. It was something that I was very fortunate enough to, um, someone gave me a chance and I, I kind of ran with it um, and discovered something I was like passionate about. And it, re it was research that was very much kind of adjacent to the clinical world. Um, Cause you were looking at kind of why melanoma cells don't respond to targeted therapies. Oh. Um, so that for me kind of set the foundation. I continued that research even through medical school. Wow. One of my oldest mentors, Ashani Wiratna, she's been, I, I can't kind of say enough positive things about her. I think she's like the truest mentor in the sense of the word where you support a person with like no, like there's no benefit to yourself. You just want to see that person succeed. And like, I really look up to her as someone who I hope I can help uh, kind of similar people in the future, um, kind of the way that she did for me. Um, but it was her lab, fantastic research that was incredibly interesting. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry, you're gonna. No, no, I'm okay. just. I'm, it's, it yeah. sounds like a lot of pathology. Like a lot yeah. of pathology is in this, and it sounds like you gotta like a little bit of bench work. You gotta yeah, like a so little bit of basic. Science. I don't want to. Yeah, I don't want to kind of. Um, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Glamorize? Kind of sugar, sugar coated. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of bench work. So yeah. it was basic science. So a lot of pipetting. Yeah. Um, but I mean that research beyond sort of develop, helping me develop this passion yeah. for. Um, percutaneous oncology. It also opened up a lot of opportunities. So I had the chance to um, get a work in a fellowship abroad in Zurich, Switzerland, wow. kind of continuing that research. And that's really what set the stage where in the back of my mind, I knew I wanted to do something with kind of skin cancer or just cancer in general and have that be part of my future medical practice. And that's why I was kind of on the fence between mm -hmm. Medonc and Derm. I think what really turned it is, is the kind of procedural aspect of dermatology. I, I love being able to uh, you know, have the privilege of, of working with my hands. I think that's such a, an interesting aspect mm -hmm. of the, the specialty, being able to see yourself get better every day yeah. um, while also helping people doing kind of something that I'm passionate about, so. And where do you see your future? What do you see your future career? Because it's, it's an interesting uh, distinction that you made in, that in the bio, right? You're deciding, you know, you want to do a career in academic medicine. Well, a lot of dermatologists go into private practice. You know, they have a great life, eight to five, nine to five, probably see their patients come home. You make great money. You have great hours. Uh, you get good vacation. It's a good life. Why did you pick academic or right now you're picking who knows what's going to happen in the future, right? But right now you're thinking academic medicine as opposed to private practice. Yeah. And I think that's a great distinction. And I think before I sort of go off on my tangent about yeah. why why academics, I think a nice thing about derm is that you can kind of have a little bit of both. Got it, okay. Um, there are private practice dermatologists that are very active in research, mm -hmm. which kind of bridges into that academic realm. Um, you know, we'll get lectures from private practice dermatologists. So you certainly have that ability. Yeah. I think that's why a lot of people choose private because you can kind of add what you like into, you know, what are things that are passionate about? What are things that make you feel like you have a satisfying career? Got it. But for me personally, I think you choose academics because you want to see kind of the most medically complex patients. I mean, that's how, at least my thinking, I think in, in Mo's, it's a subspecialty where if you're not in an academic center, you possibly may not be seeing kind of the more advanced challenging cases. I mean, of course, I don't want every case to be challenging. I think, unfortunately, that's kind of a recipe for burnout. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I think that's how you build your skills on those challenging cases, you know, trying to help people, trying, you know, pushing yourself to learn working in those multidisciplinary groups, you know, those are really only opportunities that exist in academics. And I think 
where my head is now, that's what I'm most interested got in. Got it, so, got it. Yeah. You mentioned burnout quickly. Yeah. Do you ever felt burnout throughout your your training? Or Yeah, I, I short answer, yes. Okay. I think it goes back to that, uh, that point that I made where no matter how, I guess, sort of time-friendly, especially, especially like dermatology, yeah. like, you can always pour, you know, you can make it so that it's it's very demanding on your time. I think, you know, having my chief year, uh, it's been a big demand on my time. Not that I feel burned out, but I, I can see how, you know, an individual could feel that way. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's certainly something that maybe isn't talked a lot about in dermatology or maybe is overlooked because of kind of the great aspects, yeah, yeah, especially yeah. No, that, no, no. that you mentioned, but... I think it is, is. Which is why it's so important that you're talking about yeah, it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because it's, it's. I absolutely. mean, no one would think it. Sure. Especially yeah. based on the statistics I said yeah. at the beginning. Yeah, I think it is quite insidious. Yeah. I think residency. It goes back to your point. Residency is hard. It's you know, there's no way to get around it. Yeah. I think when you're you're you only really have three years to learn all this stuff, yeah. and I think now that I'm graduating, that reality is dawning on me. Yeah. That you know, you're no longer going to have that kind of helpful person over your shoulder. You can lean back on, bounce things off of. Certainly, you can always text a mentor, yeah. and uh, I'm excited for that aspect of practice. Yeah. I think it's fun to, to stay in contact with attendings that way. But you know, in the moment, you're you know you're the person, yeah. so you only have so much time to really kind of learn with that supervision. And, and I think, and yeah. you said so you felt it before. Can yeah. you just tell me how you identified you were getting into that zone, how you knew you were in that zone, and then how you got out of it? If you're out it's, of it, maybe you're still feeling burnt. Yeah. I think now I'm like having an existential yeah. crisis. Yeah, like, no, no, am I'm I, it here. Am <laughs> I burned out? <laughs> uh, so I think it it starts very subtly. Yeah. I think feelings of burnout. I th- I think you just you start to kind of lose interest in in or at least lose time to do things that you're passionate about, like outside of medicine. Yeah. I think it's it's a slippery slope to only you know to only be passionate about medicine. I think that's kind of a dangerous thing. You you need things that are going to renew you outside of it. I think for me, that's spending time with my wife, spending mm-hmm. time with my family, you know, being completely disconnected from my Do you have e- any kids? Sorry. I have no children. No yeah. Children. Yeah. Um, but I think that's a way that you just kind of center yourself, yeah. at least for me. But in terms of feeling, yeah, I think it, it's it's if you realize at the end of the day that you've done nothing but work yeah. for like two to three weeks What did straight. you do? Do you think you put too much research, too many other commitments? Yeah. I think for me when you're pursuing a fellowship and, and Moses is classically like a pretty competitive yeah. uh, fellowship, like a lot of um, dermatologies and honestly a lot of fellowships, but, or a lot of dermatology yeah. fellowships. But I think you, you get in this yes man mode or yes woman mode um, where you just take on more and more things for fear of the people that you say no to thinking that you're not a team player or that you're not motivated. And in reality, and the, the kind of the thing that, that dawned on me is that I can only produce good work to a point you know, you can only extend yourself so far. And once you find that edge, it's an issue. Uh, and I've certainly been in that position mm-hmm. before where you take on too many projects and, and it starts to erode into your residency learning. I think it's always important to remember that if you're in residency and you're doing all these things, your number one job should be to be a resident, meaning learn as much as you can, you know, treat your patients in the most kind of compassionate, you know, efficacious ways as, as they deserve. And, and certainly, um, you know, making sure that that doesn't become priority number, you know, three, four, five, six down on your list uh, and keeping those priorities outside of medicine very much towards the top. Yeah. Um, when that balance gets mixed up, I think you're going to be burned out in no time, unfortunately. So. How do you, because it's perfect. I mean, it's, it's it sounds bad, right? But it's, mm-hmm. you're the perfect person to talk to for this because it, it, as a dermatologist, I think the competitive nature when you're getting into the residency, who knew it continued in residency when you're there? This competitive continues still when you want to get your fellowship, right? It, it does. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, if you want to do a fellowship, that that it's hard to turn off that mode. Yeah. And I certainly felt that and definitely— How yeah. did you fix it to yourself? Because, I mean, mm-hmm. it's 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 hard. I know med students. I know residents. We're, we're in the zone. We want to be the best. We want to be competitive. We're always doing things. It's It sounds bad, but we're checking off checkboxes. We're getting things. We want to get these things published. We want to get these things there so we can be the most competitive, so we can get into the most programs, so we can— because we have this picture in our minds. If we go to this place, we do this program, we know we're going to be a happy attending and we're going to be doing these procedures— with these smart people, so we're learning these things. But we forget, you know, the the classic thing. It's a cliche, right? But we we want the destination. We don't yeah. want the journey, right? Yeah. So how did you, I, I guess, how can you save, I guess, other residents, first years, second years, in dermatology even? Um, how do you make that decision? How do you say no to people? How do you know personally where to draw the line? Yeah, and I love the way that you described that before I start, yeah. where it's very much like, 
you get into this mindset where it's like, well, like when I get into med school, like I'll, I'll be, I'll be able to relax and like, I'll feel so much better. And then you're like, oh my gosh, I need to get a res. Once I get into residency and I match there, we'll be good. And then you very easy, even easier, I think easiest to fall into the trap of once I get to fellowship, I'll feel so much more relaxed. But the reality is, is I think you, those things that you do and, and the, the personality that you develop and personality in the sense of the things that you take on, they follow you. So it's very difficult to disconnect yourself and, and kind of downshift because uh, you build up so much momentum. You can't just come to a screeching halt. So um, to answer your question of how do you sort of avoid that, I guess, how do you say no? You know, I think learning how to say no graciously is a skill. I think it, it took me some time to learn how to structure, I think, emails where instead of saying, you know, I don't have the bandwidth to take this on right now, but, you know, maybe say, you know, at X time in the future, I'll have an opening and I feel confident that I can help you at that time. I mean, that was something that I got comfortable doing. Mm -hmm. You know, you only, you want to really maximize your effort on a few things. Uh, and I think once you get into fellowship, at least for Moe's fellowship, if it makes anyone kind of feel better about the process, I think it becomes less about the sheer volume of things that you're doing uh, and more so about the quality of those things. And I think certainly, and, and as you move up the medical ladder, most important is the relationships that you build. So relationships with kind of attendings and, and uh, peers so that when someone says, you know, um, something about Zach, you know, everyone's face lights up, everyone's excited to talk about him, says, great guy, like would love to work with him. Because at the end of the day, I mean, you already went through residency, you're like, the knowledge is there, you're applying to fellowship, you just want someone who's going to be, you know, hardworking, great attitude, uh, you know, kind of patience. Mm -hmm. and, and those things, are, you know, are not ubiquitous among residents. So I think, you know, having those relationships with attendings to be able to say that on your behalf is so important. So do you make, did you take any part in the decision of who gets into Jefferson residency at any point? Uh, so I, we had interview day, yeah. um, la it was last Saturday. Yeah. Uh, and you know, we, we interview them and have a play a role yeah. in the rank. I, and Got it was it. interesting to kind of, so I never had obviously that view kind of yeah, behind yeah, yeah. the curtain in a way of, of how the um, the matching process goes. So, so I did have that experience. Can yeah. you give us whatever you're allowed to say or whatever, anything, yeah. just a view into that? Because I think this is, um, imagine yourself, Boy, right? Okay, In yeah. third or fourth year yeah. of medical school, yeah. you've thought dermatology for five, six, seven years at this point, yeah. and suddenly someone's telling <laughs> you, oh my God, this guy is there. He's admitting me yeah. to dermatology program. Yeah. So can you talk to that student, that yeah. person who wants to get into dermatology above all else, any advice you can give them to make them more sure. competitive and get in? And Absolutely. Become a dermatologist? So I will say, first off, like all the derm applicants are so impressive with CV wise. Like it's I reading through them, like y'all are doing incredible things. I don't know where you find the time. That was my opening question for so like <laughs> half of the applicants was like, where do you have time to practice jujitsu and bake? And to learn Russian, and then also you have like 10 publications. So oh not to say that you need, I don't want anyone to think that you yeah. need that to get into dermatology, but I would say the biggest thing, and I try to give people this advice, I think, and I'm not trying to be trite, but I truly think that if you are someone who's easy to talk to, I think, and hold a conversation, you know, your CV is going to speak for itself. I mean, you, you, you're in an interview because we want to get to know you. Um, we want to know if you're someone that we can talk with. And I think the way that you carry a conversation, just the sheer ability to kind of just talk about your hobbies, you know, seeing someone's face light up when they talk about something, you know, uh, I think that speaks to their ability at some level to identify with patients. So I think those individuals are those that are going to be able to understand their patient's concern, you know, see the significance that it's having on the patient's life and address it appropriately you know, everyone is hardworking, everyone's driven, you know, everyone has the ability to be a great resident, I think, from the academic perspective when you're applying into dermatology, but I really can't understate it that having like an easygoing, those are, those applicants are the ones that I was, um, I interviewed with a, another first, one of our first years mm -hmm. and kind of the, the conversations we have after are all centered around like, Hey, you know, she was so easy to talk to, like, like such a fascinating hobby with like practice kickboxing or the baking, like just being like, easygoing, humorous, easy to talk to. Yeah. And like, I, I feel like people are going to be like, that's your advice. Yeah. It'd just be easy to talk no, to. No, like, it's come good. on. Man. It's good. It, no, it's helpful. Yeah. And I don't know if you can talk about this. Tell me if sure. you can. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but is there, can you tell me about the weighting of the interview? Like, is there, uh, 
is it like a score system and then you like based on your score you get this level in the rank list is it a subjective thing where you all sit around a table and say you know they've got this score and this score but he was really bad in the interview and she was awesome during the interview so maybe we'll bump this person up how does it how does it work so i will say the disclaimer is that as residents we're not sort of party to the final kind of oh, the, the final room is mostly is all attending um, kind of ranking we basically get the ability to score our applicants on like a standardized question got that it, we um it. kind of every group had to ask them ask I the see. applicants a standardized question so we'd rank that what was the question was it multiple it, questions? it was um no it was a single oh man what was it, it oh it was uh um what's like a challenge uh have you ever like challenged in attending or felt like you had an issue uh, with an attending and how did you kind of address that uh, cool. or a senior resident got it so like again like a common interview yeah, question yeah, yeah, not yeah. like i remember i got asked what piece of furniture would i be what? I, yeah what did you say? A comfy uh, office chair. I don't know. So uh, we what were chatting. What did I say? Jesus Yeah, Christ. right. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, you got to think about it, man. Um, I said a nightstand. A nightstand? Because it's like you put all the like the crucial things about your day go on your yeah. nightstand, your alarm clocks. And and I, I feel like I'm fairly, I'm pretty dependable. Yeah. I feel like if people have an issue or, or they come to me, like I'm going, I'm going to try my hardest to address it. Like I feel like I'm a, a source of advice. I don't know. It was a stretch. What if people stub their toes in the middle of the night? I've done that. Yeah, seven true. Times. Yeah. <laughs> they could all go bad, you know, um, but so that was my answer. Got for it. That. Got it. I was chatting with, with an attending the other day what about that. Random freaking question. So many people do say like couches. I would be annoyed. If someone yeah. asked me that question, yeah. I'd be annoyed. I'd be like, you got to be kidding me. You know how stressed I am right now. You want to know what kind of furniture yeah. I'm going to be right now? <laughs> exactly. Are you kidding me? Do you know what I'm doing right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I will. So uh, sidebar yeah. kind of related to what yeah. you were saying with, with regards to um, what we look at in applicants. I think part of it also is how that person reacts to that question. Of course, yeah. So we would ask a standardized question and like, I would say like the vast majority of applicants, you know, would have an answer ready and, you know, it didn't sound rehearsed, but I think it's always helpful to one sort of at least try to, to have an answer. Mm -hmm. I think there's a million ways to answer that yeah. question. I think no one's going to fault you for maybe like turning it on a tangent, like say like, well, you know, I saw another resident have a similar thing or you know, well, I didn't necessarily have anything. I, I, you know, I went through this event that was kind Got of similar. It. Like, no one's going to stop you yeah. and be like, no, this is the yeah. question. So I think that's helpful. Got it. Um, you know, and also not necessarily getting totally kind of off guard, I think is helpful. Yeah. So, and and honestly, I think those like furniture questions are like, so you just don't, like your brain just doesn't shut off. Yeah. You start like copiously sweating. Yeah, and yeah, pass yeah. Out No, it's something. like, it's yeah. like how many cups of, how many cups would it take to fill this room with water? It's like these, these silly yeah. questions. Like hard, I get, yeah. I get it. You want to yeah. see how they work under pressure and random questions. I, by and large, as someone who's gone through the, the interview process, yeah. Those are very rare. Yeah. So yeah. I don't want anyone to freak yeah. out. Be like, oh my god, I need to <laughs> just turn it off and work on my furniture. Chase and, lounge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sofa. I don't know. Exactly. Yeah. Nightstand. Nightstand. Yeah, yeah, That's so. a good one. Yeah. So, so, so you give the waiting. Uh, I mean, you give the score on the interview. Sorry. Yes. And then, so and then you submit just that. Hand, we just hand Got over it. like a rank list. Okay. Um, Can you be like, don't admit this person? I don't. I would never say that because I yeah. think all our applicants they I think they would be excellent yeah. residents. I think it's just it comes down to like fit. Yeah. Um, I think that's big in residencies. I think there's residencies big and small, the residencies where there's just one resident yeah. per year. And I think it takes a particular person to fit well in that environment. Yeah. I think other residencies are quite large and obviously a different type of person for that. Got it. Um, but I would never, well, I would never say that. I would say, you know, maybe they wouldn't be the best fit for this Got program. I would it. say short of someone doing something in clinic that, you know, you know, inappropriate yeah. or something, yeah. then obviously you speak to the attendings Got about it. that. But Got thankfully it. that was like exceedingly rare. I mean, I didn't witness anything, yeah. but you know, I, I, I think it's always important. Um, and we could talk about the importance yeah. of away rotations in okay. dermatology, which I think is probably the biggest delineator for getting into derm um, because people are able to see how good of a fit you are, see how you interact with uh, the residents, the attendings, and really importantly, the staff. Mm. I think the MAs are like the backbone of, of a clinic. So mm. being kind to them, when you're asking for things, introducing yourself to everyone in clinic, including the MAs. I think it's not something that I necessarily, you know, make a big deal out of if, you know, a student doesn't introduce themselves mm -hmm. to like everyone. But I think that's, it's such an easy, mm -hmm. not easy thing to do because I know it's hard to go up to people you don't know necessarily, but I think it's so important. And yeah. it's such a simple thing to do, I think yeah. is the right word, that it, it speaks volumes about your character. If yeah. you just, you know, introduce yourself to everyone around clinics, you never know, like the the, you know, the um, front desk person might say, you know, Alex said hi to me every morning, like had a great conversation. Yeah. I learned a little bit about where yeah. he was from. He, you know, he asked, talked about my weekends. Like 
I think that makes a big difference. No. I really do. No, it's, and I've, it's like yeah. a quote or something like that. But you can t- judge a person's personality by the way they treat waiters and help staff, right? It's yeah, kind of like this. It's kind of a thing. So, so do away rotation okay. is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I I think that was a big reason why. I mean, I did an away rotation yeah. where I matched for fellowship. Got uh, it. And I really think that was probably the major reason. Is there why a certain I'm, number that you should do or anything like that? I would do, do as many as you can like comfortably fit in your Got schedule. It. Got um, it. You, I mean, and and it's hard, right? I did like four ways, and yeah. by the end of it, you're like, I can't, I can't smile at this. Like, <laughs> you're benign- living in a new place. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm living in like an Airbnb for a month, and you're smiling at like the you're most. You're interviewing all day, every day, yeah, too. It's exactly. Like, oh, yeah, your God. mouth hurts from smiling, but it's it's part of the hustle. That's what you got to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Do. So. Okay, let's step back a little bit and talk about more general dermatology. What is the best thing about being a dermatologist? Ooh, best thing. So. First thing that comes to mind is the variety. I think you'd be hard pressed to find a specialty where one patient might be a skin check where you find a skin cancer, another patient right after it might be a rash that they're completely unsure about. You know, maybe they're on a chemotherapeutic regimen or, or something, and there's some kind of mysterious etiologic agent there. You know, and then your third patient is an excision of, of a cyst or mm-hmm. something. Um, so I, I don't think there are many specialties where you have that ability to really kind of diversify your day and have things that kind of change things around. And you can also like structure your clinic too. If you're like, I really enjoy cutting out skin cancers, I'll try to see more of those. Um, That's something that, uh, you know, people can can do in private practice. They can see certain conditions and and kind of prioritize those as well because you enjoy them. Yeah, no, that's cool. And the counter question, of course, is what is the worst thing about being a dermatologist? Ooh, worst. I mean- Or it doesn't have to be worst. No, no, it's like annoying things, anything. Yeah, I, I would say- and we touched on it before. I think it's just how, like, the word that just popped in my mind is, like, helpless you feel as, like, a first-year derm resident. <laughs> we have this uh, conference at Jeff that I think is hugely educational and helpful for your growth as a resident, but is uh, a little bit of, it's it's not the most fun as a first year. And I'll explain it. So, essentially, it's called CPC, so Clinical Pathologic Correlation. And we submit these cases um, where the first, it's basically just an image. So you put the image up and the job of the first years traditionally is that you say, okay, you know, Zach, you're one of our Durham first years, like describe it and give a differential. Red. Yeah. (laughs) One inch diameter. I don't know. Yes. Yeah. No, that that was my technique is I would excruciatingly (laughs) describe the lesion to like a point, like a little bit across, like focally on the Western edge. The Western. Uh, Yeah. 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 Uh, A little bit of shadow while I'm like thinking of the differential diagnosis in the back of my head. That was, that was my move. Um, so, and the hardest thing is, is I mean, description is crucial, like yeah. very important where there's a very specific kind of language to dermatology that is important, very like vitally important to learn, um, but also the differential diagnosis. So that's a big part of dermatology where you, you know, many conditions can look similar. Mm-hmm. So you come up with, you know, three or four things, three or four things, you're an all-star. Some of them, you know, I remember first year, I'd be like, I'd have one thing on yeah. my mind. I'd be like, I can't get to two. Yeah. So, and I, I should like also include that this is like broadcast. So it's technically a CME activity. Oh. Uh, so it's broadcast to other attendings because um, it is like very educational because there are um, like literature reviews at the yeah. end where you go over uh, the current literature about a condition, something unique about the case. So it's very educational for even individuals who are past residency. But that means there's like 45 people on the Zoom. So you sit there and you're sweating a little bit. I think it is incredibly helpful for learning um, and never once, like we spend a lot of time making sure that the first years like don't feel targeted. Yeah, we don't. No one laughs at you and says, "Oh my ah, god, you no. suck." No, well, how oh do you my even god, become no, a dermatologist? No, resident? not at all. <laughs> Everyone's very supportive, and a lot of times the attendings will be like, "Okay, like that. That's a great start." Yeah. You know, you described it, or they'll even get out in front of it and say, "This is like this is a, this is a second year case. Like describe it, and then we'll move on." You know, Alex as a second got year, it, like describe it. it. So very collegial. I I really enjoy it. Um, I think. Visually, dermatology is is probably you know the most demanding visual specialty, um, and it's so crucial. Yeah. So those experiences are are like very important. But again, worst part of dermatology, I think, those first floundering. Yeah, those first like months of of CPC conference, you are just like you're you're drowning a little bit. Like your <laughs> your blood pressure goes up when you're like next up. Someone will go out on vacation yeah. on that, and they're only they'll be cycling through three instead of four, oh, and you're just no. like. Man, like, why'd you have to go out? We're just getting crushed. Watching. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, that's okay. Yeah. That's, if that's the worst, it's I know, not too yeah. bad. But no, I, I mean, I, I've loved my my three years. So, awesome. Yeah. So a little bit of a tougher question here. I Please want you see. to picture yourself three years into being an attending. So you've been an attending for three years now and whatever, wherever you go. 
if I gave you $100 million at that time, this is tax-free money, it's in your bank account, would you, A, you have four options, continue working full-time, B, change to work part-time, C, switch careers entirely and become a pizza maker or something like that, or D, go live on a beach somewhere and hang out with your wife chill out. Yeah. So, like you said, tax-free as yeah. if like 100 million or like 60 know, million is going to drastically well, change. Every time I, I say this question, yeah. like the attendings who are like looking at their bank accounts, oh, yeah. like, like three years away from retiring, yeah. like, is that tax-free? Does it go into my 401k? Where yeah, do you go? Yeah, you got to step away and from like, the and table. I'm like, and, like, and I'm like, no, no, it's t- it doesn't matter. It's it's yeah. going to be, what, worse, you'd say they chop still $50 million, sure, sure. okay? So, okay, yeah. 50 million tax-free. Yeah. All right. Um, I mean, three years out, I got to keep working. Yeah, okay. I mean, I think when you're in a surgical specialty, it's like fellowship is just the beginning. Um, you basically have a year to obviously learn Mose and interpret like frozen path, but you also need to learn reconstruction. Mm-hmm. And it takes way more than a year, I think, to like really feel comfortable. Mm. So I would never want that skill to go away. That being said, though, I don't want to be like, people are going to be like, what a gunner. Um, I would probably, I don't know. I mean, three years out, my wife is going to kill me. Yeah. She wa- sees this. <laughs> She's going to be like, see, this is why. Uh all right, well, I would dial it back maybe a got little it. bit got three it. years out. Got it. But, so I, but you have maybe to. Maybe like 80%? Yeah, but you have to keep, work. you ha- you gotta it, keep it, working. I think you got to keep working. And it's, it's like, I feel like that's what gives you, you'd have a great four months, like or five yeah. months with all that money. On the beach, yeah. But I don't know. I mean, like you, you need, I, I'm a strong believer that it, it's so important, I think, to be, to help, I guess in your pursuit of being resilient, I think it's important to have something that you're passionate about. Yeah. I think something that you can, even after the toughest day, you can look back and say, like, what, what like, a privilege this mm-hmm. is to be able to do this. Like, I truly feel like I helped people. Uh, and that's, I mean, isn't that why we all go yeah. into medicine, right? Yeah, no, so, or you should. That's, yeah. That should be the reason yeah, you yeah, go into sure. it. Um, um, so I dial it back a little yeah. bit, yeah. And yeah. where do you see, so where, when you're practicing as an attending, do you see yourself as a professor of a medical school? Do you see yourself as a research fanatic doing lots of research and then doing clinic? Do you see yourself as a 100% clinician seeing patients all the time? Where do you kind of see yourself as a faculty member? Yeah, I think, I don't see myself as a full-time researcher. Got I think it. my bench work was like very foundational yeah. to who I am and what I'm passionate about, but um, not something that I kind of see myself doing uh, in the future. I think clinically focused research is something that I'm interested in. Mm-hmm. Um, I think dermatology is one of those specialties where it's tricky to find kind of large studies and, and kind of significantly powered research for a lot of the, the problems mm-hmm. and the questions that we create. So I think being a part of the clinical research community who's able to answer critical questions in like yeah. the dermatological kind of surgery realm is something that I'm interested in doing. Yeah. And I think that's kind of another reason why it's important to stay in academics because yeah. I think it you know, by seeing those more complex patients, maybe you want to think of a question that hasn't been answered yet, um, or you start seeing kind of patients of a sufficient volume where you're able to kind of help answer pre-existing questions um, to kind of find solid answers. So for me, I see myself having that as part of my practice, but I I don't foresee that taking time away from my clinical Got practice. It. So it. hopefully okay. we'll, we'll augment. But, Got it. Yeah. So, so clinician with some research. Yeah. Not necessarily a big teaching role, though. I don't know. That's teaching is so much fun, though. Yeah. So, and that's like, I, I, I wish I could rewind yeah. this and just like we go back and tell yeah. all the reasons why I want to do academics. But I mean, teaching is is one of the first things I think you start doing as a senior yeah. resident, uh-huh. and it's it's a really cool feeling. Yeah. Um. I mean, to teach someone something that like you just recently mastered is, mm-hmm. and then seeing that like light bulb go off or like, and I think that's the best person to teach it to with a recent master. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Master is a very strong yeah. word. Yeah. <laughs> recently proficient. The recent. Prof- Proficionado. Yeah, yeah, I like that. That's yeah, good. That's, um, but I, I think in surgery, it's like very, it, it's kind of cut and dry yeah. in terms of, you know, learning a skill and practicing that skill. And that and that's like a lot of fun. Got it. Like our first years, again, not to, you know, they're they're going to be all they're like great. pumped yeah. up after this, but yeah. um, they're like excellent surgically. Uh-huh. So I remember we had like a workshop at the beginning of the year yeah. and they just all like, they crushed it. They were just wow. like throwing stitches. I was uh-huh. like, I didn't even need to teach them much. <laughs> um but I have taught them like one or two things with with the people uh-huh. that I've worked with, and it is so cool to see you know work I you know early in the year and then now like the skills are so much better and and it's it's that's that's really fun like yeah. very gratifying. So I do want to teach. So, so you want to do it all? Yeah, I'm running out of yeah. <laughs> bad. Okay, switch the answer from yeah. the hundred million back yeah, to hundred. Yeah, there's it. not enough time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So cool. And then in dermatology in general. 
Do you see any cool advances in the future? Do you see any Moe's of the, of the 2000s coming up or any cool new thing, any robotics coming in, any, any cool things in dermatology that we have to look forward to? Yeah, I think derm's a really exciting specialty because there's a lot of biologics coming out. Okay. Um, I mean, they've been coming out, so you you know see ads for. I don't know if we're allowed to use like trade names, but like you can say whatever. Oh, perfect. You want. It All right. Matter. Awesome. Uh, so like, do, probably, yeah, there you go. <laughs> you can say bad things. You could say anything. You never know. Uh, yeah. So like, do Like yeah. right now, like that's like all over TV. Yeah. It's the like eczema and asthma. Medicine. As long as they're not sponsoring you, that's the only thing. You yeah, have to no, say conflict. Don't worry. Like, like big do is in my yeah, pocket. Yeah, don't yeah, worry. Yeah. Um, so you see like adverts for that all yeah. all, all the time. Um, so that's a biologic for um, atopic dermatitis yeah. or eczema. Yeah. And it was like the only one in its class for a long time, and honestly, a life changing medicine for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, but there's kind of more agents coming out for treating eczema. Now more agents coming out for treating psoriasis. I think we're kind of entering the age of, I don't want to say personalized medicine because I think that's like a little bit overused. Yeah. But I guess more targeted medicine um, rather than using medicines that basically just kind of turn down your immune system at the expense of the patient. You're getting things that are kind of turning down the inflammation specific to different diseases. Got it. So I think it's super exciting because it's terms like at the forefront of, you know, we treat bi psoriasis with biologics, yeah. we treat eczema, we treat hydronitis suppurativa. Yeah. So, and I think that's only going to continue um, as time goes on. So I think even if you do general dermatology, yeah. there's a great chance to be a part of those advances, um, whether it's kind of in a clinical research capacity or just using them in clinic. Yeah. Um, so yeah. New drugs. That's, that's yeah, cool. Yeah, new that's medicines. Amazing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, now we're on to the part of the, the interview where I ask kind of general questions. These are oh, questions what? I ask every single person that sits okay. down here, so All don't right. worry. So okay. do, you have any, uh, do you have any general advice for people entering? I like to ask this question because healthcare medicine, it's not an easy field, right? You were, we were yeah. talking about burnout yeah, earlier. Absolutely. We're talking about the hours, we're talking about the research, the competitive nature. Do you have any general advice for people entering this career, entering their residency, going through residency, going through med school? And this can be anything. This can be lifestyle. This can be relationships. This can be finances. This could be anything. Hmm. Oh, man. General advice. I would say, like, don't, don't lose track of your support system, Got whatever it. that might be. I mean, I still, I made time. We have, I have, like, an annual hangout with my friends from nice. high school every kind of uh, like late December uh -huh. or Thanksgiving time. We've done it literally since we've graduated. Did it happen yet? Because it was December, what is it, 15th? To the so, 16th today. Oh, man. So it happened around Thanksgiving. Got and it. I, I got COVID. So, oh, but no. to, to, to like emphasize how important it was, they yeah. were like, all right, we're going to like, they got like a fire pit outside and nice. I just like sat in a chair far nice. away. We just like chopped it up. That's for, awesome. for, yeah. So they're, they're great guys. I'm very lucky. Um, and I think it's important to keep those things going. Um, so whatever your support system is, make sure that it doesn't just exist, but you keep making it a priority. Yeah. Um, I think it's, you know, not just medicine. I think as you get older, it's easy to like text the old friend and be like, let's hang out. Yeah, yeah. let's hang out. And then you like never, never talk again. Anything. Yeah, exactly. I've, yeah. Um, yeah, we're all guilty of that. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's important. I. It's funny you mentioned finances because yeah. I, I was going to say that I think that's something that like me personally didn't have a lot of background yeah. into, but I think it's it's crucial that you at least develop some type of financial literacy you know, if you're becoming a doctor, you know, everyone's becoming a yeah. doctor that's, you know, interested in going to Durham. But, yeah. um, you know, you're going to be, you're going to have the the ability to to make a very nice living, mm -hmm. but it's very important that you understand how to kind of build wealth from that. Mm -hmm. So I think the the easiest thing to do is just read. Mm -hmm. So uh, a book that I really enjoyed is like, I Will Teach You to Be Rich by Ramit mm -hmm. Sethi. Um, right oh, nice. Yeah, I think it's up Didn't there. Didn't see that when yeah. I walked in. That's good. Or maybe it's not there. Well. I used to be there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. We'll, we'll so that's great. Yeah. Um, so I think it's important to, and there's there's tons of other ones that that are super helpful, but I think it's important to build that vocabulary, yeah. build, you know, just a very basic understanding of investment, of how to build, you know, not just put money in a savings account, yeah. but build wealth. Got um it. so I think that's starting that in residency, I think is is really important. Perfect. And uh yeah. Any other books that and these don't have to be? Oh man, I love the books question. It, any, it doesn't have to be finances. It could be a common theme here is uh, what do people say? When breath becomes air, mm. a lot of people say, yeah. um, "What's the?" F I'm messing. It's somewhere right there. Oh yeah, the, the House of God. Uh, people yeah, say. Yeah, I read House of God. Derm is not like House of yeah, God. No. Yeah, <laughs> no, I hope not. No, there is. I no, hope not a lot of medicine no, isn't like yes, House of God. That's yeah, a, that's a great point. Yeah. Um, I mean, one book that I, I really enjoyed, so, I mean, I, I love to read. It's yeah. something that I think um, de-stresses me. 
I mean, from and I really like fiction and nonfiction. I yeah. think it's helpful to read one of each. Yeah, I do, um, I do the same thing. No, nice. I do. I do one. I have one fiction book going, at the, and yeah. then one nonfiction book going. Nice. Um, I recently read Outliers. I've been putting it off by Malcolm Gladwell. I think that's a helpful book because I think it. It's easy in medicine to to kind of covet what you don't have with regards to like a knowledge base, and maybe mm -hmm. just say, oh, like maybe they just study all the time, or yeah. maybe they're naturally smart. Um, I think it it allows you to kind of realize that you know, one, inherent things aren't necessarily the reality and, and there's something to explain kind of why people either are the way they are, or have the success that they have, um, and that it's something that it's achievable for you too. Mm -hmm. So I think Outliers is important with that regard. I enjoyed reading Perfect. it. It's kind of interesting. Um, another book that I read about like a year and a half ago is Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor mm, Frankl. Great one. That's, I think, really important with just keeping things in, in yeah, context. Yeah, it's it's so easy, I think, in medicine and, and obviously working through the covid pandemic, I think, or at least the beginning of the COVID pandemic, it put things into perspective with like the true kind of like fragileness of human life. And I think it puts into context when you're stressed about studying or you're stressed about, you know, a presentation you have to give, like the reality of like the struggle that you're going through is very much like you need to kind of have context context yeah. for that. Yeah. And that book, I, I think just shows kind of the importance of relationships and the importance of, of mindset. Um, and was really just kind of profound yeah, when I read it. So. It's amazing. I mean, this yeah. guy is going through the, the worst thing of all yeah. time, right, yeah. that we know of. Truly. Uh, and he's yeah. he's saying, you know, I can get through it. it and his, his whole point of it, which is amazing, you know, you no one can take away your thoughts, right? Yeah, no one can 100%. control what you think. Mm -hmm. So if you think kind of, I can control this, I can phase this in some kind of way. And he said the people that died next to him were the people that didn't have a motivation. They didn't have a way to kind of finagle their thoughts. That's not the right way to say it. But, you know, control their thoughts to yeah, a way that yeah. makes them kind of motivated to live, which is a crazy thing to think yeah. about. I think it, it puts like the word resiliency yeah. into like an entirely different context. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of the effect it, it had on me. So yeah. uh, that's a great a great book to read. Very heavy, admittedly, of course, but I'm trying to think of like a fun No, fun that's, book. I mean, those, yeah. those are good. Those, those are good. Three yeah. books They're are perfect. perfect. Three books okay. are perfect. Okay. If one comes up, mention it later it. or something like that. Sounds good. Um, now we're getting even beyond medicine. We're oh, getting boy, to okay. general life. All right. So if you could speak to 18-year-old yeah. Alex... And give 18-year-old Alex any piece of advice, what would you say? It could be anything again. It could be like, you know, bet on the Eagles winning. And when did they win? 20, <laughs> anything like 17. That. I'm a Steelers fan. Uh, I mean, but I support the Birds. Go okay, Birds. Okay, yeah, okay. it's hard not to, right? They're, they're doing great. You better say that here. And yeah, yeah, yeah go Birds. Yeah. Um, I'd probably say keep doing what you're doing. I One thing that I always tried to do and that I honestly got from my parents was just, and again, I... I promise I'm trying not, not trying to be trite. No, no, no. But, but just work hard. Yeah. Like I'm a I'm a big believer that everything is not going to work out like you expect it to, but it will the probability that it will will be maximized if you just put the effort in. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important too to to mention that like work hard doesn't mean like, you know, I don't want you getting like 4 hours of sleep and and uh, you know, driving yourself, you know, to the bone, but I do think that working hard and putting the effort in and being that person that also has a positive attitude, I think that's important too. I think, you know, you're, you're going to find that you achieve a lot more than you would yeah. if you didn't have that as kind of your driving tenant. And that was something that like, I can, <laughs> so it's a funny, uh, I guess, uh, evidence of that, you know, 18 year old, my uh, work ethic was that I won, I can't believe I'm saying this over, you know, a podcast that's going to go on the internet, but, uh, I won the hustle award in oh. high school. Yes. It was, it was, a I was a JV hockey player uh -huh. and I won it one year. It was like kind of embarrassing because it was like, well, this is a word for like the kid who's not that great, but he tries really hard. <laughs> and then the next year, I won it again. And I was like, like, I remember I shook my coach's hand. I was like, you gotta stop giving this to me. <laughs> like my friends in the crowd were like, yeah, like, like is that Rick Ross song? Like every day oh, I'm hustling. No. And they were, yeah, yeah. I mean, they were like my best friends, yeah. but they were dying. And I was just like, man, geez. hockey fan, even in high school, hockey fans, friends that show yeah. up to hockey games yeah. can be tough. Yeah. Yeah, it can be, but, yeah. Um, especially the opposing team when you go into a game. True. Yeah. So that was um, I, I again I wasn't the most skilled, but yeah. I just you know you just try hard. Yeah. You I feel like no one's ever gonna fault you for that. No. Everyone respects that, and and I think uh, that was something that eighteen year old me was starting to understand. Yeah. So I think emphasizing that, and there's so much that you don't know when you're eighteen. Like I didn't I didn't want to be a doctor when I was eighteen. I went to college with like the express intent of like, I would be an engineer, get a master's and kind of just go into industry or something. And I realized I wanted more of like that human connection. So it was a slow realization, but you know, I, I don't think I would have had that opportunity. Would I have not, you know, 
had the mindset of wanting to find, you know, lab work to kind of, you know, push myself a little bit more and kind of broaden the base of understanding that I had, you know, and that was at the Wistar mm-hmm. Institute and that was in melanoma and that started that passion. So I think dominoes start to fall, yeah. but I think the, the kind of the common factor is, is that hard work. So hard work. And yeah. this is something I've heard from obviously the other physicians and attendings here, but it seems, you know, you can increase your chances of being lucky, number one. And number two, you get so much more out of things if you just lean in. Yeah. Just lean in. Yeah. Even on your third year medical rotations, when you don't want to do the surgery, yeah. you know, lean in. Be yeah. interested in the procedure yeah. you're going to do tomorrow. Yeah. Ask the attending questions. Absolutely. All these kind of things. They're, they're fantastic. Any closing words for people interested in dermatology in general? It's all going to be okay. It's all going to be okay. No, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I like swear it will be. Okay. Like, I think it's so easy to get so nervous about the process. And I was very much one of those people. Um, cause you do, I mean, you do hear a lot from even advisors who mean, well, you know, I think the reality is, you know, the numbers are that it's quite yeah. competitive, but at the same time, I mean, two people with the exact same CV or someone who, you know, maybe just got their foot in the door numbers wise, again, as long as you're that well-adjusted person, who's going to be a great co-resident, who's going to work hard, who's going to treat patients well and with respect, you know, you're going to have a great chance yeah. of matching. And I think that's where that away rotation thing yeah. comes in and you're able to show those things off, but you know, as long as you put that foot forward, I truly think that that you have a great chance of matching. Everything's going to be okay. Yeah. That's I'm okay. very, I'm like, I don't know. I don't want to be the doom and gloom person. Yeah, it's so no, easy to be that. No and, one and does. I, yeah. I think there are realities to yeah. derm. It's tough. You know, people are taking like years off and everything. But I, I think you stand a great chance if you kind of um, have those prerequisites and then also that attitude yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. So. Side question before we get to the final it's, question. What makes a really good resident? What makes a great resident in dermatology? So the number one, it's got to be attitude. Attitude. I like having the, the positivity for when, you know, you're 30 minutes behind in clinic, you know, maybe there, there's a bleeder and an excision, you know, having kind of calm positivity, I think cannot be understated. Mm. Again, our first years, all positive, like makes them so easy to teach and like truly like a joy to be the chief. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Cause it makes my life easier. Um, Kind of, there's nothing more frustrating than someone who, when something goes wrong, you feel like you can't really count on them because they're they're getting a little frazzled, and it's it's not like it's terrible to not have that happen once in a while. But I think, you know, obviously you're in medicine, you're in dermatology, you have all those prerequisites. Kind of just focus on that attitude because it's easy to forget about that, uh, and it's a conscious, I think, act to be positive, to to be motivated, um, both at the beginning and I, I love how you brought up at the end. Like I think that's when a lot of people notice when you're at the end of residency, at the end of your training, or maybe you're in that, that, that leadership role where maybe the pressure's off you, but you're still motivated yeah. um, and positive. I, yeah. I think that's the number one thing that makes a great resident. No, so. that's great. Yeah. Okay, the big question. You ready? Okay. Any closing words in general? This could be anything. This could be you just adopted a dog, you know, don't oh, okay. do it until you're an attending. That's okay. what someone said the other day. Uh, it could be um, <laughs> okay. anything. Thinking of adopting anything, a dog. Anything. No, oh, no, no, okay. no, no, no. But All you're right. in the proper time now because you're, I got, oh, wait. Well, I got no. fellowship, man. Fellowship, yeah, yeah. Well, right. don't worry. The this dog podcast. can wait. There'll yeah, be plenty of dogs later. Um, closing words. I'm glad you kept it in medicine for a second. Yeah. I thought you just wanted closing words no, no, for like no, people no, of no. the world. Life, no, no. Yeah. Yes, be happy. No. Yeah, yeah, well, that's important. Um, I would say like realize the, the privilege it is to like have this as your career. I, I can, so I only got into one med school and I got waitlisted at another. And I remember how, like my parents remind me of this because it was I just like matched like texting my parents and my dad like waxes poetic when he like texts texts me back and it was like what a an, like an achievement this is we're so proud of you you know ever since X day he he really goes goes crazy on that and it's like it's it's very flattering yeah. I'm very lucky to have loving parents like that but I think your um, mom what does your mom not say anything or what my, my, well, <laughs> my mom is like that in person okay my dad never says those things okay got well, it got that's not true I don't know oh my God. I'm just thinking of your mom watching all right we gotta this cut all like, of it my, I'm gonna get roasted my parents when I go home did but, your mom not text you she's like I, I, simultane- I didn't think you'd get in yeah, anyway yeah I managed to yeah upset both my parents probably with that comment they're both fantastic they're incredibly supportive I I w- truly am the man that I am because of yeah, that yeah yeah anyways oh, oh man all right I I think it's just important to understand that that when you're a doctor, like looking back when you were applying to med school, like what an incredible privilege it is. Yeah. It's just, you know, again, I'll just kind of rehash what I said before in the sense that I can remember like opening my acceptance letter the, the, to Drexel and just looking at my parents saying like, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And I think it's easy to lose sight of that sentiment. 
Um, but being able to take care of people, being able to kind of look back on your life and feel like you you made a difference in other people's lives, which, which I don't, you know, it's that's sometimes a hard thing to do, I think. Um, you know, sometimes people have to look outside of their jobs. We have the privilege of it having, it's, it is our job. Um, and then I also think there are other small things. I mean, you have the ability to understand that, you know, you're able to provide like a stable financial life for your family and help others. And I think that's a huge thing too. So I think keep that in perspective when, you know, I was thinking about like, what if I don't match? And one thing that kind of like calmed me down was saying, look, you're gonna be a dermatologist. That's like amazing. Like, don't get stressed out. I mean, I'm very excited and honored to be have the ability to be a Mohs surgeon, but you know, I would have loved to be a general dermatologist too if that's how things shook out. And I think anyone should be happy to be a doctor. Um, so you know, let that kind of center you and still push for those goals, but keep them all in the context that you've gotten. You're you're like at the mountaintop, like you're looking at the next mountaintop that's already below you. Like the highest thing is getting into med school. I've had so many derm mentors that told me that the hardest thing to do is like one, get into med school and then two, get into Durham. Like it's just like, it stacks up and it's one is not harder than the other. So everyone listening to this, you're in med school, you're already over the highest mountaintop. You're going to be fine. Perfect. Yeah. No yeah. better way to close. Perfect. Thank you so yeah. much, Alex. And uh, you might need to send your mom a nice text or yeah, oh something my, yeah, like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Sweat, you so much, yeah. Alex. All right. Thanks so much. Appreciate thanks. it. Yeah. <laughs> that was perfect.